Hi everyone, welcome back to Rich Reviews, welcome back to the channel, I'm Richard and you join us here today at an establishment in Chippenham, Wiltshire called Sarah Jane's Cafe. Now the proprietors of this cafe are very good friends of the channel and they've kindly loaned us their establishment to record some videos and to record this video for you. So today's video will be brought to you from Sarah Jane's Cafe in Chippenham, Wiltshire. The subject of today's video is why don't people drive their supercars all year round? Now you can replace the word supercars with high-end cars, highly valuable cars, but you know where I'm coming from. Now a lot of this is going to be my personal opinion, I'm also going to talk generically as well. It's been very interesting storyboarding this video. Storyboarding is what we do when we prepare for a video, in effect it's like bullet pointing so you have an appreciation of what you're going to say. So it's been very interesting preparing for this video because all the different varying opinions and believe you me I do appreciate this really polarizes people's opinions on, on, on this subject matter. So I'm going to break this video down into two sections. The negatives of driving a supercar all year round and the positives of driving a supercar all year round. Now I live in the UK so I'm going to talk from a reference point of the UK. It is location dependent. Um, obviously, if you're in a sunny climate, it's a lot different. You know, it's more viable to drive a car all year round as opposed to if you've got heavy winters. Um, you know, like in the UK, we don't have we have heavy winters compared to, to a lot of places in America, say, for example. So getting into the negatives of driving a supercar all year round. This is going to be location based because I live in the UK and our winters are quite bad. Now, when I talk about driving the car all year round, I'm going to be focused really on the split between summer and winter, especially with regards to the, the UK. But obviously there's the situation where you, you're not gonna put, if you've got a supercar, you may not be putting a lot of miles on the car during the summer as well. You may be trying to keep the mileage low and we'll get into that in a minute. So in the UK, you've got the situation of cosmetic wear and tear on the car and you've got mileage wear and tear on the car. You can segregate those two areas to be the areas that cause depreciation on a car from a very high level point of view. There's, there's obviously subparts associated with, with those, but let's just keep it on a, on a high level basis. Now, with regards to wear and cosmetic wear and tear on the car, a lot of that comes from winter period, driving in the winter. In the winter, we have a lot of salt put on the roads in the UK. That salt rots cars. Um, you'd say, okay, well, 458 Spider and 458s in general are aluminium, but aluminiums um, can oxidize, so they, they can deteriorate. They don't rust, but they can oxidize. So you do get, um, you do get cosmetic damage on cars, on aluminium cars through, through moisture ingress. In the winter period, you've got all that slush, you've got salt, you've got all that mixed together, you've got grit from the road, you've got, um, you know, if you live in the countryside, you've got soil coming down from from the land that comes into the road as well. And so you've got slush, grit, soil, mud, stones, all this all mixed in together. You drive a supercar in that, number one, it's gonna cause cosmetic damage to the car because you're gonna have that thrown up against the wheel arches. It's gonna cause the seal end caps to get marked, to get pitting on the end of the seal end caps. Obviously you've got full PPF, it's gonna help to mitigate that, but it's not gonna mitigate it all. In addition, you've got the situation where it's going to throw more moisture up into the actual car. So you're going to get water ingress into areas that you wouldn't normally clean, or you're going to, you're going to get water ingress into hidden, hidden areas in the car um, that you know, may trap the water for a period of time. Um, so that's not good. And then because the car's dirty, you're going, to have, you're going to be washing the car more. That's going to introduce more moisture. And in, a, in an environment, in a winter environment, the car's not going to dry so easily. So you literally you're going to be washing a car and if it's raining when you're washing the car or if it's slushy or if it's snowing, what you're going to do, take the car up the road for a drive to dry it out? Well, you do that, you're going to introduce a load of muck into it again, a load of slush, grit, salt, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's, it's like an endless loop. Um, and yeah, people are going to say, well, cars aren't made of chocolate, they're not made of ice cream, they're not made of cheese, they don't melt and they are designed to be out in the elements. But 
Ferraris aren't really designed to be driven all year round. You know, if we take if we take a high end marks like Ferrari, Lamborghinis, etc., these cars aren't designed to be to be driven all year round. They're, they're designed as a special car. Um, even though you can, you know, with the modern day Ferraris and modern day Lamborghinis, you can say you could daily drive them. Well, you know, daily driving a supercar is not really using it as a, a car that you would take it to the supermarket on a daily basis. And you'd go and pick the kids up from school and, you know, you just wouldn't use it in, in that respect. People, in general, people just don't. Very, very rarely are, are supercars used in, in that manner. And then you've got the you've got the other respect from the point of view of mileage. A lot of high end supercars are mileage sensitive. Now, what do I mean by that? Um, what I mean is the more mileage you put on these cars, the more it devalues them and there's certain markers. So you get over a certain mileage threshold and that potentially devalues a car by a lot more because people people psychologically don't want to buy a supercar when it's hit certain markers in its mileage. It's, it's, a, it's a joke in the marketplace. Everybody wants to buy a low mileage car, um, but everybody talks about how cars should be driven. I mean, <laughs> you can't have it both ways, you know, you, you can't have it where um, people are driving their cars all, all the time. Um, but you, then you go and look for a supercar and people are demanding these low mileage cars. Go figure, you know. And you have these people saying, ah, oh, cars should be driven all the time. Supercars should be driven all the time. I drive mine all the time. And then you find out they're only putting a couple of thousand on their car anyway. And they, you know, maybe because they've got multiple other cars. And it's all very well saying flippantly cars should be driven all the time. But it's, it's so easy to say that. But when it comes to reality, that rarely actually happens with these special cars. If you look at it from the point of view of, of my car, of my 458 Spider, I bought my 458 Spider with 5,150 miles on it. It's now got 8,000 miles on it. And I... I'm mileage sensitive about this. You know, I'm thinking, well, you know, if I'm looking to sell this car in the next year, two years, next six months, do I really want to take it over the 10 or 11,000 marker? Is that going to depreciate my car substantially? We're living in this weird situation at the moment where we have a weird bubble. Most cars are in a bubble. There's certain cars that aren't. Possibly 458s are out substantially outside of that bubble because last of the actually aspirated, etc., etc., etc. I'm pretty sure you've heard it all before. So they are potentially quite substantially outside of that of that bubble that we're in at the moment. Obviously, supply and demand, you can't get the cars there for all the cars stack down and become more valuable. Once the situation with supply and demand is recovered um, due to parts being more available, cars being manufactured, then that that bubble that we're in at the moment um, will mostly recover and we won't be in that situation anymore. It will fall down back to normality. Also, with respect to being mileage sensitive, this brings up this can hook into other subject areas. You've got the, the dark side of mileage sensitivity, and that is mileage inhibitors. Nobody talks about mileage inhibitors, and I'm not really going to go into it in any great detail. To be honest, I don't know much about it. I know that they exist. I've never used them, never would use them, of course. It's illegal to do so. And I just don't believe in doing that. You know, if I'm going to keep the mileage down on a card, then I keep it down by not using it. But mileage inhibitors are used extensively and it's just a fact you know yeah multiple yeah supercars have have um, mileometers in various different um, sections in the car so the 458 for example has a mileage counter in various different ecus around the car one sort of in located near the gearbox and one located sort of around the engine side so you've got you've got multiple ecus on a 458 and multiple ecus on most modern supercars people are so sensitive about buying these these lower mileage cars that it, it then motivates or provides motivation for people to try and keep the mileage down. This is all something that comes about from mileage sensitivity. The whole thing is a pain in the friggin' ass. <laughs> it really is. But unfortunately, that's where we are with it all. You know, people want to buy these lower mileage cars. So I know I've rambled on a bit there, but, but this is an important factor to, to think about if you're looking to sell your car. Now, if you're not looking to sell your car, it doesn't matter. If you're looking to keep hold of the car, then it just doesn't really matter. It's only really relevant if you're interested in retaining value in your car. It's a very empowering situation to be where you're wealthy enough, where you can just drive beautiful supercars and not give a damn about the mileage on them and not give a damn about the, the cosmetic condition of the car because you can just throw money at it and get the car repaired. It, what a great situation that would be. I'm not in that situation and very few people are in that situation. So just to summarize the negative aspects of driving a supercar all year round, You've got from a very high level point of view, the effect on the cosmetics of the car. So cos cosmetic damage of the car, the looks of the car, etc. And you've got mileage sensitivity issues. So you've got the, the impact of putting more mileage on the car. 
So now let's talk from a positive point of view. So what's the positives of driving a supercar all year round? Again, a lot of the obvious things here. You're keeping the car warm, you're driving the car regularly, seals in the car are going to be well lubricated. This is a problem when you don't drive a car regularly. Oil doesn't get round to all the seals in the car. If you think about, for example, um, to prevent oil from getting out from the crankshaft, you've got a, 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 like a rubber seal or a silicon seal um, around, the, around the crankshaft, around camshafts, etc. This keeps the oil in and prevents your from coming out. Now, these, the, the, the wear on these seals is reduced by oil being located in the area. Now, how does oil get to that area? Obviously, it's pumped around the engine. It's pumped around the engine when you're using the car. Now, oil won't be getting round to these seals unless the car is started, unless the car is used, you know? Um, so that's a great benefit. You don't get so much wear on the seals of the car. Um, bearings are lubricated, bearing shells are lubricated. So the shells of the crankshaft, um, shells around the camshaft, um, those sort of areas that are lubricated better. The car is brought up to proper operating temperature. As long as you're, you drive the car properly, if you're driving it, you're not just starting up, moving it out 10 foot and then stopping it again. That puts more wear onto a car, of course. But as long as you're driving, starting the car up and you're warming it through properly, obviously going through a proper warm, warming up stage before you put any, um, before you use any performance of the car. Um, so it, warming the car through has major benefits. You're reducing moisture in the exhaust system of the car and generally in the car through condensation, etc., by keeping the car warm through on a regular basis. And also you're probably likely to reduce um, electronics gremlins, electrical and electronics gremlins from occurring. These generally happen when a car isn't regularly used. You now, how often have you come back to car? I know I've had it personally, for example, you know, when I was storing my 993S over the winter period, I came back to it one time. The car was on a, on a battery conditioner and I had a, a surge protector connected to the battery conditioner and I went to unlock the car and the, the central locking system um, stopped working and it was, it was, it was um, linked to a comfort board um, or a comfort module that was underneath the driver's seat. I had to change the, the, the motherboard on that module. And that just decided to give up the ghost while the car was being stored. Maybe that wouldn't have happened if I'd been driving the car regularly. I don't know. I and mean, that was quite an expensive repair. But, you know, these things happen. It's more likely to happen on, on, on the more modern supercar because you've got more electronics in them. So it, those, sort of, those sort of electronic and electrical gremlins probably less likely to occur if you drive the car all, all year round. Now, certain cars aren't affected by all this. Now, when I say certain cars, I'm relating to really high value cars and of course, really low value cars. So you've got the, the, the polar opposites of the scale. Now, when I say low value cars, I'm talking about your, Vol your Volkswagen Golf GTIs, your Vauxhall Cavaliers, um, your Abarth SSs. <laughs> you know, my car's now done 136,000 miles. Did I care about reducing mileage? Did I care about the car being mileage sensitive? Of course I didn't, you know? Yeah, if I'd kept the mileage really low, I could have resold it, but it's low value car. You don't really tend to care about those sort of things with a low value car. It's only the special cars. Now, do you have this segregation of, um, you have middle range supercars, your 458, your Hurricane Spiders, et cetera, et cetera. Then you have your high end supercars, your, your low volume supercars. Um, and here I'm talking about your 458 Speciali, your 458 Speciali Apertas, your 599 SA Apertas, and then getting onto the real high ends, your 250 GTOs, your 288 GTOs. So let's look at it from the point of GTOs. Let's focus on GTOs um, with regards to it not really mattering about, um, about being mileage sensitive and really about cosmetic damage. And I'll get onto that in a minute with regards to these high-end cars. So for those wondering what GTO stands for, I'm sure most of you know anyway, but it stands for Gran Turismo Homologato. Now in effect, that means that certain amount of cars had to be built to homologate the car or the, the, that particular model of car for Class B racing, if, you, if you're looking at the 288 GTO, say for example, that's why only 272 were made, um, were put into production. That's the minimum amount that had to be produced in a run of production to homologate the car for Class B racing. So let's look at the 250 GTO. Okay, right. So 36 250 GTOs were put into production. Now it's 39 if you count the four litre models. This isn't including prototypes, okay? So this is just production models. So let's say 39 overall, including the four litre models. So 39 of those were only ever made. 
Now, I don't know how many are actually still around. I think most of those are still around. Um, now, these are worth millions, you know, if, you're, if these 250 GTOs, on a daily basis, these cars increase in value, especially in the climate we're in at the moment. So it doesn't matter if the car's been trashed, they will be rebuilt because people who own these cars are multi, multi millionaires. The most, one of the most famous 250 GTOs is owned by Nick Mason, obviously a very wealthy gentleman, very nice gentleman as well, lets people, um, lets people uh, look at the car and pour all over it. Um, but you know, he, he owns a 250 GTO, it's famously got the number plate 250 GTO, which in itself is worth a fortune. But that car's been trashed multiple times. It's been tracked. I've seen it rant up and down the, the Festival of Speed circuit, you know, on the hill climb at the Festival of Speed. Incredible, you know, that a, a, value, a car of that value, circa 20, 25 million, is ranted up and down the, the Festival of Speed circuit. Um, but that's because there's so few of those cars in existence, so few were ever made and so few still exist. That it doesn't matter. That car is always going to have that value. It can be rebuilt multiple times. If you look at the car, I've looked at that car very close up. The car is immaculate. It's clearly been resprayed multiple times. And I know the car, I think I'm pretty sure the car's been trashed a few times, that particular car, as all GTOs, because they were race cars. You know, they, they were race cars for the road. So, you know, my, my son just corrected me there. The I'm saying 20 million for these cars. Apparently, you know, that one of them sold recently for 70 million dollars. You know, I mean, that's just crazy money. These cars are never going to lose that value. They're always going to be worth that, irrespective of how much cosmetic damage they get from being driven, you know, in the winter. I mean, these cars are never driven in the winter, of course, you know, and they're hardly ever driven, mostly kept in museums, etc., etc. But they will always retain their value. Mileage doesn't matter. In fact, whenever you look at the 250 GTOs, if you go and look at them online, in general, there isn't a quote of what mileage the car's done because it doesn't matter because there's so few of them. It's the same thing with the, two, with the 288 GTOs. It's unclear how many are actually still remaining. I know some of them caught fire. I know one in particular caught fire and it was rebuilt from prototype, from prototype parts. But that car as well, only 272 ever made, even though it's a lot higher numbers than the 250 GTO. It still doesn't matter what mileage these are done to, to many part. It still really doesn't matter because there's so few of them actually that were made. It doesn't really matter. But if you get back a bit lower down the scale, you get into the Specialis um, and the Speciali Apertas. So the Speciali, so those in 2,501, perceivably, that's not strictly true, but we won't get into that. But there's only, let's say there's 2,501 Specialis Coupes that were made. Now, that's a lot more cars and there's a lot more on the marketplace so that does matter mileage does matter and the cosmetic damage on those cars does matter and this is where these cars and you know your 250 gtos your 288 gtos as well these are traded as commodities now i'm quite interested in buying a speciality coupe the speciality aperta is around the 600 7000 totally out of my ballpark unless i become very wealthy somehow subscribe guys <laughs> Um, then that isn't going to happen for me. And that's fair enough, you know. But at some point in the future, I would love to own a Speciali Coupe. So I've been watching the market quite avidly. And it's a, you, you get these particular artifacts, you get these, these, these situations occurring in the marketplace where a lot of these dealers, they have storage facilities. And so a lot of these people with these high-end cars, they store their cars in their storage facilities. And it doesn't take much of a leap of faith to see that what's, what's probably happening and almost certainly happening is that they've got these, these owners of these cars on fast dial and they're probably ringing them up saying, OK, look, the market's changing again. You, we can get you another 10, 15K for your car that you paid for it. Would you like to sell it? And then the car's advertised. Now, the car and many of these special cars, especially the Speciali Aperta, they never turn a wheel between being sold. They might be sold three or four times. And none of the owners actually ever driven them. In fact, the car may still be located in its same venue. They're sold as a commodity. They're sold like a piece of art, which is, which is, you know, can be perceived as crazy. These cars are fantastic pieces of engineering. And, you know, if you use that quote, they should be driven, they were designed to be driven. Some of these cars just are never going to be driven very much. And, and you know, that's a shame to some degree because you sh they should be enjoyed. From my point of view, 
I will drive my car to the extent where I enjoy it. I take it for coffee brands and I take it to shows, but I do try and keep the mileage down, but I do enough mileage to enjoy the car. I mean, you will have seen it on video, you know, we've driven it quite a bit. We put 3000 miles on it in the first year and a half that we owned it. And that's a lot of mileage for a Ferrari. It is what it is, you know? These cars that are bought and sold as a commodity, you know, different people view the ownership of a car in a different way. So these people who sell their cars as a commodity, for them, a lot of it is just physically owning the car or it's just making a profit on the car. So if they're using it purely as a commodity, then from their point of view, it's just, they're gonna make 20 grand on the car, they're gonna make 30 grand on the car, they're gonna make 40 grand on the car. Interest rates aren't very good at the moment. So putting that money into, a, into an interest rate in a bank account is pointless. So you either put it into stocks, put it into Bitcoin, Bitcoin's gone down a bit at the moment, or you can put it into, into high-end cars um, and use cars as commodity. And this is why we're getting this stepping up at the moment with Speciali, Speciali Apertas, um, and these high-end cars because they're being used as a commodity. Now, when we get, um, when, when the newer cars come out and more availability of the high-end supercars, maybe that will change a bit. I'm hoping personally that values will drop a bit on the specialities, but maybe they won't um, because it's still a low number car, but it's not a very low number car. So as I say, they're still mileage sensitive, these cars. They're not way out in the stratosphere where you've only got 36, 39, um, 272 of these cars made, which, you know, the mileage isn't really going to affect them. With these intermediary cars, you get this situation, as I said, where they're, they're sold as a commodity and um, these cars are never really going to have much mileage on them, which is a real shame when you... and you know, you go around and look at these cars, you know, if the car has been driven, you know, if he's going to, if there's been any issues on the cars, you can, if you know the cars, you know where to look to see if a car, um, if the mileage is matching the car. So there are ways of checking if you, if you know what you're looking for. Um, and of course you get the situation where certain cars, um, hold more value because they are a certain specification with regards to speciali coupe say for example launch spec is a very big thing so that's rosso corsa the blue nart stripe and the general the standard specification in general people don't get hung up too much with too much carbon being required on those cars that's a nice to have and the stereo is a nice to have as well. Some people prefer the Speciali Coupe to have a stereo um, system in it, but many of them don't. And that, that doesn't matter so much. The key thing that people look out for on those particular cars, for example, is launch spec with regards to exterior body color and the interior um, leather and um, Alcantara trim. So these high-end cars uh, that are traded as a commodity, you also have a, another subpart to that where these cars are are often just bought like a piece of art to just look at, you know? So a lot of people do buy these cars and don't put mileage on them and don't drive them, obviously, putting mileage on them because they love to just look at them. They love the fact of just owning these cars. And I can understand that, you know, from my personal perspective, I don't put that many miles on my car. I keep the mileage down as much as possible, but I still put 3,000 miles on my 458 Spider in the first year and a half. That's classed as quite a lot of mileage for that period of time. But I can understand the situation where just owning the car is a cool thing. I mean, um, you probably will see it if you haven't seen it before, check out the conversions that I did on, on the garage to be able to widen the front entrance of the, of the garage and the interior of the garage as well to make it easier to open the car doors. But so we keep the car obviously in the garage and we, all, we at the back end of the garage, we have a section where we train. So we have some dumbbells and all this sort of thing. And my son and I train. So when we're in there training, we're looking at the 458 Spider all the time. And it is a cool thing. It is a cool thing to see the car in there. You know, we've got a red Ferrari in the garage and we're spending a lot of time in there training. Uh, you know, every day we're in there training, you know. So it, it's a cool thing. So I can totally understand that. It's a cool thing just to own one of these cars. For me, that's not enough. Obviously, I want to drive it and and um, and feel the car get all you know get all the, all the sensory, all the sensory input from the car, um, the smell, the feel, the sound. Um, but for a lot of people, just having this these these cars in their garages is cool. And some people have these cars in their living rooms, you know. <laughs> And these cars are pristine. If you started up these cars that are in people's living rooms that have been there for years, they'd fail. You know, you get oil leaking all over the place. And probably there may not even be oil in these cars anymore. They're, they're such a museum piece that, there's, that they don't actually have any, any, any liquids, any lubricants in them anymore. Um, I, I guess that would happen in, in, in some situations, in some circumstances. So I can totally understand that aspect of it. Um, that being a substantial part of owning these types of cars is just knowing that you own it and going out and looking at it. 
I know that sounds crazy. Um, it sounds to some people that will sound warped, but you know, it's, what, what, how different is that than you know looking at a piece of art? You know, I can totally understand that. You know, if people buy a nice piece of art, whether it be a sculpting, uh, whether it be a painting, an oil painting, a watercolor, whatever it be, you know, you part a, a lot of owning that particular item is the beauty of it and being able to actually look at it on your wall and knowing that you own it. You know, a lot of people have these these pieces of art, these works of art hidden away in a, in a safe room um, and they hardly ever go into those safe rooms. So for them, it's just the fact they know that they own that particular item. So there is some aspect of that that bleeds into these high end supercars as well. So coming back into something that I mentioned at the beginning, um, the fact that this really polarizes opinion. When I was doing some research on this particular video, I saw some statements out there, you know, more money than cents. Greed, showing off, you know, that's the perception that many people have for why people own these supercars and don't drive them all year round. So, you know, that's, those are very negative aspects, neg very negative viewpoints. Why should people be condemned for not driving their cars all year round? It's up to them, they own the car. But there really is a polarized thought process out there. <laughs> a lot of people really dislike and really go against people who don't drive their cars, their supercars all year round. It's quite interesting. So I think I've waffled on enough about this now. Um, it's been an interesting subject to, to do some research on and to, um, to actually get my thoughts together um, because this is something that has been very interesting to, to build, to create a video on. And there's been a lot of opinions out there and this subject doesn't really seem to have been, have been targeted much, especially this situation where people flippantly say, you know, cars should be driven all the time, just get out there and drive it, you know. It's, it's very easy to say that when, you, when you've got 160, 170, 180, 200, 250, half a million, a million, you know, some of these cars, LaFerraris, two million, you know, when you've got that tied up in a, in a, in a specialist car, it's, it's so easy to say, oh, they're designed to be driven, go out and drive them. Well, you know, that just doesn't happen, you know, <laughs> that's not realistic. That's not really a realistic viewpoint. But uh, I hope you've enjoyed the discussion anyway. I'd be very interested to know your opinions. Please drop your comments below. What's your thought process? You know, if you have a really nice car, do you drive it all year round? How much mileage on average do you put on your cars in, a, in an annual period? You know, if you, drive, if you own a supercar, how much mileage do you put on your car? Do you advocate driving your car all year round? Um, or do you advocate being sensible about the mileage. So I hope you've enjoyed today's video. If you have, please give it a thumbs up, give it a like, very important for the good old YouTube algorithm. As I said earlier, today's video has been brought to you from Sarah Jane's Cafe in Chippenham, Wiltshire. Thank you very much to the proprietors of this venue. Very kind of them to let us video here. Got some great future content to come, got some events planned, um, and we will be doing some more, some more content with the 458 when we get the 458 back. Currently it's away at the moment, having some work done on it. More on that later for a video part two. If you're not subscribed, please think about subscribing. Thanks a lot for watching guys, and we'll see you in the next video.